Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرُ الصَّابِرِينَ صدق الله العلي العظيم Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. Allahumma salli wa One of the most important aspects of our belief system, one of the greatest manifestations in the belief in the system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gave to humanity is the belief in the Mahdi, the rightly guided, awaited savior. Without the belief in the Mahdi, one's belief cannot be completed. One may not achieve the completion of faith without believing in the Mahdi. Hence the Prophet ﷺ said, وَمَنْ أَنْكَرَهُ فَقَدْ أَنْكَرَنِي The one who rejects the Mahdi, the one who does not recognize the Mahdi, is like the one who has rejected me, is like the one who does not recognize me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a set of beliefs. In order for us to achieve the true faith that God wants us, we must complete this entire set. We cannot pick and choose. I want to believe in this aspect, but I disregard other aspects. And the greatest lesson that Allah has given us to humanity in the Holy Quran is the example of shaitan where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed him to prostrate to Adam. He said, oh Allah spare me, give me a different test. Spare me from prostrating to Adam and I shall worship you in a way no other being has worshipped. Did Allah accept his offer? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, Iblis, the name of the devil, worship me the way I want, not the way you want. Because the minute that you form your belief system based on your own desires, based on your own wants, you're no longer believing in the one true Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way He wanted you to believe in. We can only achieve the completion of faith by believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way He has wanted. That, why, that is why our greatest mission and our greatest challenge in this life is to form the correct beliefs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. Now here usually there is an objection or there's actually a fallacy that you hear in our societies every day. We are told that there are good people who don't necessarily believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take an atheist as an example. This atheist may appear to have a good heart. He may have good deeds. He could be a generous person who loves humanity. What about them? What will happen from them? Will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept their deeds? Will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them on the day of judgment or no? Since they have some good actions, since sometimes they have some good intentions. What happens with these people? This is a common question that we are asked in our society and that runs across our minds. To give you an example of why it is it very important to form the correct belief system in order for us to deserve the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because as we learn from the Quran and from the lessons of Ahlul Bayt, only those who form the correct belief system they deserve and have the right to receive the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those with incorrect beliefs, Allah is merciful. <coughs> he can choose from His own mercy, He can decide to give them from His reward. But they are not deserving of the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense that they don't have a right to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, you have to give me the reward for my actions because Allah will tell them, you did not believe in me in the first place, nor did you believe in my reward in the second place. 
So you have no right over me. Whereas the believer, he has a right on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be rewarded because Allah has promised the believers to reward them. Let me share with you a couple of examples to demonstrate why a person who does not form the, cor the correct belief system does not have a right on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ask for a reward. Imagine if you want to have a house built for you here in Halifax. You go to a construction company and you sign a contract, you give them the specifications of this house and they are to build this house and you promise them, you sign a contract, at the end I'll give you $600,000 for building this house. Now what happens is after you sign the contract, the construction company instead of building a house here in Halifax, they misunderstand the contract or they misread the contract or for whatever reason, they go and build that house in Winnipeg. What happens here? This construction company could be, could be a good company with a good reputation. They could have the best intentions. But at the end of the day, did they do what you wanted or no? Are you going to pay them 600000 or no? If you're generous, you could give them something because they worked hard. But at the end of the day, they have no right to get the reward from you, to get the price from you. Why? Because the contract was that you build the house in Halifax, not in Winnipeg, not in some other city. Because that's not what I asked you for. That's not what I commissioned you to do. A second example. Imagine if there's this important document or package. You give it to a courier or you give it to a mail person or to a ca taxi cab. And you tell them, I want you to deliver this package to an address in Toronto. Now they take this package and they misunderstand what you said or they forget about what you said. And they mistakenly, with good intentions of course, we're assuming that this person has good intentions, they mistakenly take it to Montreal and deliver it to a house there. At the end of the day, did this person achieve what you asked him to do? Did he fulfill the job? Did he fulfill the responsibility or no? It's the same with belief systems, brothers and sisters. Yes, we do recognize there are people who may have good intentions, but if they had the chance to see the truth and accept the truth and they didn't, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the day, on the day of judgment, Allah will tell them, you did not do what I asked you. You did something else, even if you may had some good intentions. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not obligated to reward them. He may reward them if He wants from His mercy. Allah will tell him, look, I'm not obligated to reward you because at the end of the day you did not fulfill what I asked you. You did not believe in the beliefs that I asked you. But because I am merciful, I can either give you a reward, I can either reduce the punishment. We have many narrations that state those unbelievers who don't recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the day of judgment, if they had any good deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pay them back in the form of reducing their punishment. That's one way of Allah having mercy on them. The belief system is extremely important. When I have a belief system that is taken from Allah, it's fixed, it has value. Those who do not, do not recognize Allah or they don't take their moral principles from their Creator, then their actions, their belief system, even their intentions were not, will not have that full value. Because anything which is not fixed does not have that full value. Anything which is fixed, you can depend on, it does not change, it has value. But when everything, when something changes, Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. It's good the train makes us do salawat every night, so that's a plus for us. The second one with your loudest of voices. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The third one for the love of Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala When my moral principles and moral standards continue to fluctuate and, cha and change, there is not that much value to them. 
Let me give you an example. When you ask an atheist, if you ask an average atheist, why is it that you do what you do? Let's say you have some good deeds. Why did you do them? You don't recognize God, of course. You don't believe in God. So what is it? Commonly, you're, you'll get two responses. The first response is either my conscience tells me that this is good. Or the second response, my society tells me. My society teaches me that this is good. Now the problem is my conscience, my society fluctuates, it changes. How can I fully depend on it and base my moral principles on it? If you were to ask an average Arab man from some tribes before Islam, why do you bury your female infant daughters alive? They will tell you it's my conscience. My conscience tells me this is something good. If you were to ask him what's your conscience, he would say my society. Society teaches me that this is something good. How can I trust my society? Another example that we see many Western societies are struggling with these days. 41 years ago in the United States, homosexuality was considered a disorder. The American Psychiatric Association or Psychological Association, in their manual, the DSM, they had listed it as a type of disorder. Now in 1973, they remove it from the list of disorders and suddenly it becomes accepted, accepted, more accepted until it becomes cool. When you're now part of that group, suddenly these days, it becomes cool. And the Supreme Court of the United States gives you the full right for same gender marriages. Allah knows what will happen the next 10, 20 years, 30 years. Believe me, one day will come in which if you're not part of that group, you're the one who's weird. You're the one who's not cool. You're the one who has a problem. Yes, you can see society going that way. Going in that trend, unfortunately. Now society 40 years ago said it's a disorder. Today society is saying it's something cool. How can I trust this society that's fluctuating? That's playing with my moral standards. That has no value. I need something fixed and the only thing that is fixed is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that really brings you into a huge slippery slope. You know, there are some people who have some disorders and this is happening in our society. You wouldn't believe there are some pedophiles who are saying the same thing, you know? Or those people who are interested in incest, you know what they're saying these days? They're like, look, look at these people, these same gender marriages. 40 years ago, it was a big sin, it was a disorder, it was frowned upon, it was illegal. Now suddenly after lobbying, after working with the media, after defending their rights, after participating in movements, they got what they wanted. The Supreme Court of the United States approved their marriages. So many pedophiles today are thinking we can do the same. From now till 10, 20 years, if we lobby, we work with the media, we work on some politicians, on some corporations, they're going to allow that for us. This is a slippery slope and they're thinking about it. And watch the day that they will succeed. And that's how our moral standards will sink. Therefore, those who don't base their actions on a fixed system given to them by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that does not have much value in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if the action itself is good, but the foundation of it is improper, has no value. So this is the importance of forming correct beliefs, brothers and sisters. Now one of the greatest beliefs that we have during our time, in our time and era, is the belief in the awaited Savior, the Imam alayhi salam. Al-Imam al-Mahdi ajallallahu ta'ala faraja. Because believing in the Imam represents believing in the unseen. And one of the qualities of the believers according to the first very few verses of Surah Al-Baqarah is what? Hudan lil muttaqeen. What is one very important quality of the muttaqeen? Alladheena yu'minuna bil ghayb those who believe in the unseen. Because believing in the unseen represents a very difficult type of belief. You have to believe in something which is not physically tangible. Now the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one form and the greatest form of the belief in the unseen. But in our times, 
the second greatest manifestation of the belief in the unseen is the belief in the absent Imam. In the Imam السلام, who is an occultation. And I tell you, this is one of the greatest tests that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to humanity. The test of the ghaybah, when you look at the narrations that speak about the state of the followers of the Imam, of those who consider themselves the Shia, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them the most difficult test, it's mind-boggling. In one narration where Imam al-Sadiq is speaking about the difficulty of the test of the ghaybah, the Imam salam reminds us of Prophet Nuh, how his people were tested. By understanding how they are tested, we come to realize how during the time of the ghaybah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually testing us. You know, one narration states Prophet Nuh salam was born on the day Prophet Adam passed away. Prophet Adam lived for about a thousand years or more. So we're, ta we're talking about maybe a thousand years after the descension of Prophet Adam from paradise to the earth. Now Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, he became a prophet. His prophethood was declared when he was about 400 years old. Now the Quran tells us something that is puzzling. Every time I used to think about the challenges of Prophet Nuh, I simply could not grasp why his people would not believe in him. Until Imam al-Sadiq in this hadith explains. The Quran tells us that Prophet Nuh was amongst his people for how many years? 950 years. And how many people believed in him before the flood at the end of those 950 years? Millions? Thousands? 70 or so people accepted his message. A man who was amongst his people for 950 years, only 70 or so accept his message. This is truly mind-boggling. Why? You would think, why? These people, after seeing a prophet of God, after witnessing the clear signs, after witnessing the miracles, after all these years, only 70 or so believe in him? What's going on here? Now when you explore and examine how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested them, it's truly amazing. You know, Prophet Nuh went through so many difficulties. Frequently his people would beat him. Especially those who came from the line of Qabil. The children of Qabil were evil. They did not accept his message. They would frequently beat him to the point where he would fall to the ground unconscious. And his wife was an evil lady as the Quran says. She was one of those kuffar who did not believe in, in, in her husband. She would make fun of him. She would say he's insane. Imagine, you're a prophet. You have a message and your own wife is accusing you of being insane. And whenever he used to hide from the enemies when they wanted to harm him, she would actually be the one to expose where he was. He went through a very difficult test. Now his followers could not take it any longer. Oh Nuh, when will Allah send the punishment on these evil ones? One day Prophet Nuh asks Allah, Oh Allah, when will you send down the punishment on these evil ones? When will that happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, Oh Nuh, I want you to take the seed of a palm tree. Take the seed of this palm tree and plant it. When this palm tree grows, it matures, it yields fruits and gives you dates, take from the dates, eat them, give it to your family, give it to your companions and then Allah will send the punishment. Everyone's now happy, yes. You know an average palm tree from it, for it to grow and to mature takes about 10 years let's say, give or take a few years, about the average of 10 years. So they said okay alhamdulillah in 10 years the faraj, the relief will come from Allah. He takes that seed, he plants it, the tree grows, grows. Imagine every day these companions passing by the tree, looking at it with hope. But this is how Allah tests humanity to see who's the one with the pure heart, who's the one with the true iman, and who's the one who acts as, he is, as if he's a mu'min. The, the tree grows, it gives the fruit. Nuh alayhi salam, he takes the dates, he eats it, he gives it to his companions. They wait, nothing happens. 
They tell Nuh, Nuh, we thought you said when we eat the dates, Allah will give us victory and He will destroy these evil ones. Nuh said, Ya Allah, you promised that if I plant this palm tree, then at the end when it gives us fruits, when it gives us dates, you will send your punishment. What happened, Ya Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya Nuh, I've extended it. I want you to take a seed and plant a second palm tree. When this second palm tree grows, yields fruits, gives you dates, then I'll send the punishment. Imagine what happened to the companions of Prophet Nuh. They, spread, they split into three categories, three groups. One group immediately lost faith. They became murtad, apostates. This prophet is a liar. He told us in 10 years the punishment will come. It did not come. The second group remained hypocrites. You know what? Let's see how this goes. This could go either way. If the punishment comes, we'll act as believers. If the punishment doesn't come, then we can show our enmity. And the third, smaller group is the one who remained steadfast. They said, no, there is wisdom behind it. Allah decided to extend it. You see how Allah sometimes tests us? In ways that if we're not true believers, we'll lose our iman. And this is how Allah tested Bani Israel after seeing all those clear signs from Allah. Seeing Pharaoh drown, seeing the stick and the, and the hand of Musa and all those signs. Musa told them, I will go for 30 days to Mount Sinai to receive the Torah. وَوَعَدْنَا مُوسَى ثَلَاثِينَ لَيْلَةً those 30 days, they were good people waiting for Musa. They had seen the signs. They were good people. They did nothing bad. At the end of the 30 days, Musa wants to go back. What does Allah do? Allah extends it for another 10 days. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extends it. Listen to this very carefully. This is important. If we want to realize how we're tested during the time of the ghaybah, Imam al-Mahdi in one hadith says, look at what happened to previous prophets. This affects each and every one of us. When Allah extended it, the people said, Bani Israel said, you know, Musa said, I'll go for 30 days. 30 days happened and he's not back. Either he's lying or he died or something happened. So forget Musa and forget his faith. What did they do? They started to worship that calf. And Musa came in those 10 days, Allah shook Bani Israel. And He revealed who was a true believer and who was a weak, weak believer or who was a hypocrite. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed their true colors. So Prophet Nuh was struggling the same thing with his people. So he takes the seed, he plants the second tree. The second tree grows, matures. Remember, it takes an average of 10 years. Now we're talking about 20 years. The fruit comes, they eat it. They're waiting for Allah's punishment. The punishment does not come. Do you know how many times that happens, brothers and sisters? The hadith from an Imam al-Sadiq says, this happened seven times. Every time they were waiting for the victory from Allah and the punishment from Allah, but Allah kept postponing it. Allah kept delaying it for a wisdom. And this is bada. This is what the Quran says, يَمْحُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيُثْبِتُ Allah, See, it's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us something because some people could say, what, is Allah breaking His promise? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes does not show us the full picture. He gives us a small picture of what's going on because there are two types of wills or decrees from God. You have the absolute one which will happen and you have the contingent one. Sometimes Allah shows us the contingent one, but He doesn't show us the real thing. It's behind the curtain, it's there. But Allah wants to test my faith. You know, they say one day, this group of children, they were taken to a camp, to a retreat, and they wanted to teach them a good lesson in how to restrain themselves, to have good akhlaq, to be good human beings. So what they did at the time of supper, at the, at the time of dinner, they offered each one a bowl of soup. They gave them the soup and they were waiting for the spoons so they could have dinner. The spoons didn't come. Where are the spoons? Someone said, we don't know. Maybe there are no spoons. Maybe the organizers of the camp forgot to bring any spoons. 
You can imagine the chaos that happened amongst these kids. Oh, these idiots, these organizers. How can they forget to bring spoons? Some of them were, na you know, nagging. Some of them started to shout. They wanted to make a fight. How can you give us food without any spoons? For 10 minutes, there was commotion. Every one of those kids was showing their real colors. What happened after 20 minutes? They told them, oh, sorry, the spoons are right there in the drawer. Go open the drawer and you'll find the spoons. You can imagine what happened to those kids. Everyone sh felt sh ashamed of themselves. Oh my God, I can't believe I said that statement. You know, these organizers, they're so irresponsible. They're this, they're that. And, all, and the spoons were there all along, but they were not shown to me. Now the next day, Again, they offered them the meal. They brought the dishes and the soup. But again, there were no spoons. Now all the kids were looking. They saw no spoons. You can imagine, not one of them complained. Not one of them. They sat as good, polite, wonderful kids. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, no one complained. 30 minutes, no one complained. Because they knew. They had an experience. They were taught their lesson. And sometimes this truly happens with us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does test us by not showing us the full picture. It's there, what I want is there, but it's behind the veil, it's behind the curtain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will sometimes hide it from me, hide a blessing from me to see how I react so I can show my true colors. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually hid the punishment and He delayed it and He's postponed it. Why? To test the people of Prophet Noah. Now with every time, His companions became fewer. They dwindled and dwindled and dwindled. Until you had how many? 70 or so. Until one day one of the companions of Noah, imagine after like 70, 100 years of being tested like that, He came to Prophet Noah salam. He told him, Oh Noah, listen, I firmly believe in you. You're a prophet of God. You never speak anything that's not true. If this happens thousands of times, I will still believe in you. I will still accept. When Allah realized that these 70 or so have this belief, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed Prophet Nuh and his companions to get on the ark, that huge ship, and Allah sent the flood and destroyed the unbelievers. But this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trained the people because Allah only wanted the purest of hearts to remain on the earth at that time because of all that corruption. This serves as a small glimpse, brothers and sisters, into the great challenges that the believers will face during the time of the ghaybah. Don't think that this test is easy. I guarantee you it's more difficult than the test that the people of Prophet Nuh went through. This is a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Imam al-Mahdi is the last representative of Allah on this earth. And therefore the test is the greatest test because we have the most complete belief system and the most valuable thing in the universe in the eyes of Allah is the truth, is the haqq, is the belief. And when Allah gives you that belief, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to give you on a gold platter. That's it. You cannot, you will not work for it or earn it. No. Allah wants us to demonstrate that we have the capacity to accept the truth of Allah. That's why in one verse, Allah says, we gave the amana. Now there are different tafsirs as to what the amana is, the trust of Allah. Some say it's the belief system. Some say it's the wilaya. We gave it to the mountains. The mountains could not handle it. It was bigger than them. It was too heavy on them. But the human being accepted it. It's very heavy. But this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us. Now when we look at the time of the ghaybah, we see that there are three types of tests. The first type of test is physical harm or tragedies. One day one of the companions of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, I heard that Imam al-Sadiq say that before the appearance of the Mahdi, there will be clear signs. He asked him, what are those signs? Can you tell them? The Imam alayhi salam actually recites this verse in Surah Al-Baqarah. 
وَلَلَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ We shall test you. The Imam says, you, the believers before the Qa'im, you shall be tested. وَلَلَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرُ الصَّابِرِينَ We shall test you with fear, with hunger, with a shortage of wealth, with a loss of lives, and a shortage of crops or fruits. وَبَشِّرُ الصَّابِرِينَ And then once this has happened, give the glad tidings or the good news to the sabirin. To the patient ones. And Imam Sadiq explains what this is referring to. He says, As for the first one, the fear. You know what the Imam says? He says, The Imam says, There will come a time in which our followers of the Ahlul Bayt, our Shia, they will see so much fear from the kings of so and so family. This is what the Imam السلام, says. Look at our world today, brothers and sisters. The source of most of the misery against the followers of Ahlul Bayt is from which family? I ask you, from which kings? You know, one politician, one official from this family, from this country, and you know which country I'm referring to. One politician, you know what once he said after the attacks of 9-11? He said to a Western president, and this is documented, he said, look, it's the end of that era in which the Shia can remain peaceful. We will do what we can to turn their lives into hell. See the past 15 years what's happening in the Middle East. The fear that is widespread everywhere. Look at ISIS and what they're doing. Who's funding ISIS? Who's behind them? Who created them? Yes, we know that the kings from this family, they could be working with other powers, absolutely. But at the end of the day, it was through them. They're behind this. And for the last 30 years, they've pumped billions of dollars to strike fear in the hearts of the family of those who believe in the Ahlul Bayt. The Imam السلام, says, الخوف, This is the khawf. Min muluki bani fulan. From the kings of so and so family. This is how, this is one way in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us. Brothers and sisters, go in many parts of the world where the followers of Al Muhammad live. There's fear, there's daily fear. Whether you're in Iraq, whether you're in Lebanon, whether you're in Syria, whether you're in Kuwait or Saudi Arabia, there's fear. Any moment you could be attacked, any moment a bomb could explode and take your life in a masjid in the month of Ramadan. This is the reality that we are witnessing. So this is the first one. The second one that the Imam السلام, states, We shall test you with hunger. How? With inflation and rising prices. I tell you, if you look at those areas which Al, the, the followers of Al Muhammad live, you see that food prices are astronomically high. And the inflation rate is amazing. It skyrockets every year after year. Meat here in Canada is less expensive in parts of the Middle East, in Iraq and Iran. It's more expensive, the inflation. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us. Don't look at us here who are comfortable. Look at millions of people. Look at the price they've had to pay for holding on to the path of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. It's very difficult. And we see this inflation every year rising and rising and rising. The third one, وَنَقْصِدْ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ The Imam السلام, says, before the appearance of the Qa'im, there will be a, an economic recession. كَسَادُ tijarat. The Imam السلام, refers specifically to a recession. We all saw the recession that happened in 2008, right? Even till this very day, there are countries suffering. Look at Greece. They're almost exiting the Eurozone because of their financial crisis. This is the only the beginning, brothers and sisters, when you look at the Ahadith of Ahlul Bayt. Because of global greed and the greed of corporations, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And there will be more and more recessions. And the most that will be affected by these recessions are the followers of Al-Muhammad. 
Sometimes it could be in the form of sanctions. How many millions of the followers of Al Muhammad have suffered because of oppressive sanctions? You tell me, you look at what's happening in the world. وَنَقْصٌ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ the, fir- the third one or the fourth one, anfus, A loss of lives. And Imam al-Sadiq salam says the way in which Allah will test them during the time of ghaybah, there will be a fast death. Look at today what ISIS is doing. Last year, on one day, 1,700 Shia youth were massacred and spikered. And unfortunately, we haven't done anything for them or for their families. Nothing. We're just looking at what happens in the world. In one day, fast death. Fast death. In one day, 1,700 from the Shia youth. This is one example. This is only one example. Then the Imam Ali salam says, in explaining, وَنَقْصٌ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ A loss or a shortage of fruits. A shortage of crops. Look at Iraq today, brothers and sisters. The country which has a majority of Shia. The agriculture is almost completely destroyed. 40 years ago, Iraq was one of the greatest exporters of dates. They had tens of millions of palm trees. What happened in the last 40 years? What did the Ba'athists do? Millions of palm trees have been destroyed. And the agriculture has been almost reduced to rubble in Iraq. This is one way in which we understand this verse as Imam al-Sadiq explains to us. But then the Imam says, وَبَشِّرَ sabirin Then give the good news that the Imam salam will reappear and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give the reward. Now brothers and sisters, I don't want to scare you, but we have to brace ourselves. It's no joke. Being a true follower of Ahlul Bayt is not easy. There are a lot of sacrifices that we have to give. You think the enemies will allow us to keep our faith easily? One day a man came to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and he told him, Wallah inni la uhibbukum. I swear by Allah, I love you, O Imam, O Ahlul Bayt. You know what Ali ibn Abi Talib told him in this hadith? He told him, if that is so, فَاسْتَعَدَّ لِلْبَلَاءَ أَوْ لِلْفَقْرِ جِلْبَابَ He says, if you really want to be amongst our followers, then brace yourself, prepare yourself, for you will have to wear the garment of bala, the garment of difficulties, the garment of trials and tribulations. We have to brace ourselves, we have to prepare ourselves. This is one type of test. The second type of test during the time of the ghaybah is the loss of having access directly to the Imam And I tell you for the true believers, one of the most difficult tests is to be disconnected from the Imam of your time. Not to have the privilege of seeing him, of going to him, of asking him. In explaining this verse, Al-Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam قُلْ إِنْ أَصْبَحَ مَاءُكُمْ غَوْرًا فَمَنْ يَأْتِيكُمْ بِمَاءٍ مَعِينٍ The Qur'an says in one verse, say that if your water, if you're short on water, if the wells go dry, if the water sources of this world, they go dry, then who can bring you pure water? Other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Imam alayhi salam says this is a reference to the Qa'im and the Ghaybah. This is a reference to Al-Imam al-Mahdi. Say if you're disconnected from your Imam, if you lose direct access with your Imam, then what are you going to do? Al-Imam al kadhim is telling his Shia, what are you going to do? This loss is very difficult brothers and sisters. It is extremely difficult. And the believers, the most difficult thing for them in the time of Ghaybah is the fact that they've been orphaned from the Imam of their time. Even though the Imam is spiritually with us, yes, the Imam is physically present on this earth. In one hadith, the Imam says, He says, we do not forget you, O oh my followers. The Imam is saying, we forget him. We forget him very easily. But the Imam says, I don't forget about you. Had it not been for that, realize that your enemies would have uprooted you. They would have exterminated you. And it's with the blessings of Imam al-Mahdi that for a thousand one hundred years, the followers of Ahlul Bayt continue to, to survive. 
despite their enemies, despite all those evil actions against them. The Imam السلام, is with us. He sees our actions. He observes what goes on with us. So this is the second type of test that we are disconnected from our Imam. Imagine if you could go to your Imam, ask him, Oh Imam, what should I do? I have so many challenges. The East and the West are doing this to us. ISIS is doing this. What do we do? We don't have that direct access to the Imam. This is a difficult test. And the third type of test, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib describes beautifully in one hadith, Al-Asbagh ibn Nabata, he says, I went to Ali ibn Abi Talib. I saw him, he was looking on the ground, depressed, thinking of something important. I told him, oh Ali, what are you doing? What's going on with you? He said, I was thinking about the 11th descendant from my progeny, who was the Mahdi. Who was the Mahdi. And I was thinking about his ghayba, his occultation, and the hayra, and the confusion, and the doubt that will happen during his occultation. Because of this confusion, many people will lose their faith. They will go miss, they will go astray, they shall be misguided. I am thinking about that. In another hadith, Imam al-Sadiq salam he says the ghayba of the qa'im shall be prolonged so much such that most of the people who used to believe in him, they will no longer believe in him. They will lose that iman. They will say, where, he, where is he? If he was there, he would have appeared by now. Then the imam says, Allah will test you, O Shia. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test you, you will capsize just as a ship capsizes into the water. Have you seen the ship? How it turns and sinks and capsizes? He says this is what will happen to the Shia. Except for the very few. As for those true believers, they will shed their tears on the Imam of their time, on the Mahdi. Only those who have a true covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will secure them the faith and will secure them the iman. This is the most difficult type of test. And we see this brothers and sisters. In many societies where we see the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, day after day they are losing their faith. This is very unfortunate. And Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam in one hadith, he says Allah will test you in a way that you will see some of the believers in the morning they have iman, at the end of the night they've lost their iman. It goes within a day. And we're seeing this in many societies. And you know where I'm referring to. We see this in many parts of the world. That's happening. Many are losing that faith. Many are losing that iman because Allah wants to purify the heart. Just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purified the companions of Prophet Nuh. After all those years, after all those difficulties, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also purifying us. It's difficult, very difficult, absolutely. But this is the path. If we want true salvation, we have to remain firm, brothers and sisters. We have to be cautious, vigilant. If you've protected your faith, alhamdulillah, what about your children? What about them? Can you imagine 50 years from now what the state of the world would be with respect to iman? If I don't actively, day and night, work to secure the faith of my children. You think 20 years from now, 30 years from now, they will have this a, the same iman that I have in Imam al-Mahdi. This does not come for free. It's very difficult to keep that. Let's not be amongst those companions of Nuh who lost their faith because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested them. Or not like Bani Israel who were tested with the ghaybah of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. But remember that the greatest reward, brothers and sisters, is given to those who remain steadfast and patient during the ghaybah because Allah knows it's the most difficult test. In one hadith, the Imam says, those who die during the ghaybah and they remain patient and they hold on to their faith are those, are like those whose blood is spilled in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another hadith, Al Imam السلام, he tells Fudayl, Ya Fudayl, the one who dies waiting for the Imam and has those good actions, then realize that this person is like the one who will be in the army of Al Imam Al Mahdi. Al Imam Zayn al Abidin السلام, he says, the one who stays firm in his Iman during the Ghaybah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him 
the reward of 70,000 shaheeds from the shuhada of Badr and Uhud. That's the reward that Allah will give them. In another hadith, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, when he speaks about the ghaybah, he said it will be prolonged so much. There will be so much confusion and it's as if I can see the Shia like cattle roaming around wanting to eat something like the cattle. You know, they roam around in order to get something, to find some grass, but they will not find it. Whoever manages to keep his faith and protect his heart from being hardened during the time of the ghaybah, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib says, he will be with me in paradise because of the difficulty of the test, brothers and sisters. It's extremely difficult. I'll leave you with this final scene about Al-Imam Al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Sudair so al-Sayrafi, one of the companions of Imam al-Sadiq, he says, once I came with a group of our companions to visit Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. When we walked into the room of Imam al-Sadiq, we saw him, he had fallen on the floor, on the ground, on the dirt, on the dust. The Imam alayhi salam had fallen on the ground and he was crying like a mother who had lost her child. We were shocked. We were surprised. What was the Imam السلام, saying? We heard him saying these phrases which confused us. What is, what is he referring to? We heard the Imam السلام, says, Sayyidi ghaybatuka nafat ruqadi wa dayyaqat alayya mihadi وابتزت مني راحة فؤادي. We heard the Imam al-Sadiq crying, crying like a mother who's lost her son, and he's saying these words. He's saying, "Oh my master, your ghaybah has deprived me from my sleep. Oh my master, your ghaybah has not given me any rest." غيبتك أوصلت مصابي بفجاع الأبد وفقد الواحد بعد الواحد Oh my master, your ghaybah, your occultation, your absence has caused my misery to be eternal. It's as if I'm losing my loved ones day after day. فَلَا حُسُّ بِدَمْعَةٍ تَرْقَأُ مِنْ عَيْنِي Therefore I cannot hold back my tears. So Deir says, we were shocked. What is Imam al-Sadiq saying? Master, why are you crying like that? Who is, the, who is your master on the ghaybah? The Imam salam, after he calmed down, he told Sudair and his companions, just moments ago, I was thinking about the Qa'im al-Mahdi. And I was thinking about the ghaybah, the occultation. And I was thinking about the difficulty of the test in the ghaybah. And I was thinking about how most of the believers at the end will lose their faith, except only very few. And this created a lot of sadness in me. This created a lot of distress in me. I was speaking to Imam al-Mahdi. Brothers and sisters, our Imam, Imam al-Sadiq, a hundred years before al-Mahdi was born, he used to cry on the ghaybah of Imam al-Mahdi. Realize how important and sensitive the time of ghaybah is, and we need to work day and night to preserve that faith.